Hi everyone, nice to see all of you, um, and thanks for having me here. Um, like you said, I'm Kyle Leach, I'm a, a registered geologist in California, and uh, I work for Sierra Streams Institute. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Sierra Streams and then about the mining toxins and the type of subtoxins that there are and how we, we are uh, working to clean them up and keep them out of the streams. So um, Sierra Streams Institute's been around for I think 18 or 19 years. It was organized uh, around some community people that got together when they were rebuilding the Pine Street Bridge and they were concerned about digging in the creek and sedimentation and what, what kind of toxins might be released from that. And so it kind of has grown over the years and we have about uh, 13 or 14 uh, permanent employees and over 30 volunteers who do river monitoring all over the Deer Creek Basin and we've recently expanded to the Bear River Basin as well. So we have over 30 sites that are monitored every month for river uh, stream quality and uh, things like that. So we are really into uh, citizen science where we're getting volunteers and to do actual scientific work, collecting data, bringing it back and, and sharing it with in a, you know, a format that people can use and, and share with the community. Um, so the, the work that I do, I, I came on about seven years ago after working in the private sector for many years and my focus has been on cleaning up abandoned mines in, and especially in this area. We've gotten some good grants from the US EPA and the Sierra Fund or the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. Um, and so we've worked on quite a few um, mines. One is the uh, Stiles Mill, which is just on the, just below um, the Pine Street Bridge on the far side from town. And then also the Providence Mine, which is one of the biggest mines in the area. Uh, so the types of toxins that you get in these mines um, are basically, what happens is the gold was put it into the rocks many you know millions of years ago but it was like an, a liquid injection of hot liquids into the, the rock and the gold and the quartz tend to come together and that's what they're going after when they're mining but that liquid the same liquid that brought in the gold also had other metals many different kinds of metals and the most toxic ones that we find around here are lead and arsenic in general some cadmium and a few other metals but generally it's it's usually mercury, arsenic, and lead that you're looking for. The mercury was introduced later uh, in the process of, of recovering the gold. So it was, it was actually mined over in the coast range and brought over here to amalgamate the gold and aid in the recovery of the gold. So the mercury I'll talk about in a second, but the other metals tend to um, be fairly stable when they're underground, but once they get brought up to the surface, they get oxidized, they break down, the metals are released and they tend to erode mostly as particles into the soil, into the creeks. And that's how you get the metal contamination in the creeks. Not so much solubility. Um, in other kinds of mining, like for example, copper mining, you have a lot more acidic conditions and then there's a lot more soluble metals that can go into the water. But we don't really have copper mines around here. There's some down in the foothills that not too big, but there's some in Spenceville and in that area. Um, so basically the, the assessments and cleanups of the metals that I'm looking at, um, the real focus is to stop the erosion of that st uh, those particles into the creek and also to you know, mainly uh, the other reason we're getting EPA uh, grants to protect human health. So we're trying to keep people from being exposed to the metals and then trying to keep it out of the creek. So we've done quite a bit of uh, water monitoring uh, it's, it's kind of expensive to do metals testing on the water, so we don't do a lot of that, but associated with my projects, we will test for the metals in the water upstream, right adjacent to our sites and then downstream. And what we found is generally when the water is clear, you don't get much metal. Um, the metals are almost not non-existent in the water, but when it's cloudy and stormy times, then you're seeing a lot of metals in, in the water, um, sometimes over the, you know, well over the drinking water standards. So. Takeaway from that is don't drink the water, don't swim in the water when it's cold and freezing and, and flooding anyway. Um, so not too many people doing that. But the real, the more hazardous thing um, would be mercury. And the mercury that was uh, was put into the, used in the mining process was has eroded into the creek over the years and, and it was lost during the process. So over 10 million pounds of mercury has been lost into the, you know, the Sierra Nevada area. and that. Mercury turns into methyl mercury by a complicated process I won't go into, and it gets into the food chain. It gets biomagnified each time it goes up the food chain. So, the larger fish, um, especially things like bass in the reservoirs, 
um, are the are the things that have the most mercury in them that people should avoid eating. So there's uh, fishing advisories for people not to eat the fish. So that's probably the worst mining toxin exposure uh, route is by people eating fish. And unfortunately, the people like the Hmong people who go out and subsistence fish, they're not really reading those advisories. So it's, it's kind of hard to get to the people that are really the most affected. Um, but for, for example, the Sierra Fund is doing a lot of work on that, um, on doing surveys of anglers and getting the word out and getting postings and things like that. So I could go on in all kinds of directions, but uh, I think I'll, I'll open it up to questions anyone has on any topic like that. I think Michael wants me to talk so, more yeah, about Yeah, so we have a mic here. It's nice if people do have questions or things you want to maybe ask while we have Ben here. If you want, just step up to the mic. Thank you. I always learn so much every time I come here. Um, I have been measuring people in Chico area with uh, their heavy metal. Mm -hmm. So I was really shocked how many people have mercury, cadmium, and lead. One kid has lead. I saw it was from the school, but now we may have a reason for the from the water contamination. So, how much water has been like cleared, like mediated so far? Are they still like contaminated, or we're achieving certain level of de decrease now? Well, I can tell you about a few. Um, one of the main sources that I know of, of metals getting into the creeks are drain tunnels from old mines and a couple uh -huh. of those have been remediated the one is the magenta drain that comes out of the Empire mine and that's a, a really good success story there was a lot of uh, toxins that were going right through Memorial Park in Grass Valley where people were playing in it they didn't even know that it was toxic and uh, they found out and they, they they closed off the creek for a while and then they started rerouting that water through some ponds it's a passive remediation system where the water gets goes over limestone rocks and the metals drop out and they uh -huh. have uh, plants that absorb metals and it's a it's a, it's it's you can see it along the road that goes up um i forgot the name of the road that goes up towards empire, empire road yeah up by just below the empire mine there's some big ponds there so that's I a success see. story there's also uh, the north star mine in grass valley too but the work i do is 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 mainly um keeping erosion of those materials into the creek and so I you know, see we have done that on several sites in, in Deer Creek and I know that there's some a lot of work that's being do, done at uh, Malakoff diggings for that for the mercury that's coming in there and uh -huh. it's an ongoing process so you know I, I think if you looked at the amount of money that was taken out of the gold rush it would probably cost all that money to clean it yeah. all up the yes. best so it's yes 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 have you ever here. studied any kind of bacteria that cleans up heavy metals? Bacteria, not so much. I know that they are kind of causing the problem with mercury. Uh, uh -huh. So, you know, bacteria tend to make the metals more available uh -oh. into the food chain. <laughs> so I don't really know how they, we've, we've, we've done stuff with plants and trying to get plants to absorb the metals. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've learned a lot about it. We haven't had a lot of success, but, but we do have some leads and people are doing studies on it and stuff like that too. I see. Are you helping um, like other uh, mining sites like Happy Camp, you know, along the Klamath River? Are you guys connected? Any organizations doing clean up there? I'm not too aware of the details up there. You know, I know I've been following the, taking the dams out up on the Klamath River and, and uh -huh. that, those issues. Um, but I don't know too much about mining cleanups up there. So we may have I, to I know get about, them. There's one really bad mine up in, uh, North of Reading, the uh, the um, oh, Iron Mountain uh -huh. know, has has actually has the lowest pH ever recorded in nature, and there's actually wow. bacteria living in that, and that's an old copper mine where a lot of metals are leaching out, and there's a big cleanup that's gone on there too. So it's a big uh -huh. super fun site. Thank you. So I do know about that. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. Has any heavy metal testing ever been done on Bitney Springs water? Um, not that I know of. I think I think it is tested by the county and I, I've never heard of it being really bad. Um, I, don't, I don't know the specific results. But you do think it's tested? Because I've heard nobody tests the water. I don't know. I think that the county environmental health may have information on that. I've heard that they've put up warnings before and people tear them down because if yeah, people want to drink that, that water. So 
I personally don't drink it because I have not seen results. Right. Yeah. So. I'm, that's, I'm concerned because I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So my other question is that I do regular uh, heavy metal testing with hair analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed an increase in arsenic when I moved to my current location, which is well water. Hmm. And uh, point, yeah. I switched over to RO and the arsenic levels dropped. Mm -hmm. So I asked my landlords about it, and they told me that the well water was tested by the county and rated as just fine. So how did that happen? Uh, that's a good point. Um, arsenic in ground in groundwater is an issue in this area. It's not everywhere, but, but certain mines, or I mean certain locations, there is arsenic. It's naturally occurring usually, um, but it's usually in the areas where mining has occurred because the arsenic was concentrated during the mining process. So... What I've seen is that um, people, uh, uh, particularly around the uh, Banner Lava Cap Mine up on Banner Mine, Banner mm -hmm. Mountain, uh, there, there's higher arsenic there. And so when you do drill a well, it's required to be tested by the county for arsenic and other metals. And if it's elevated, then they require or you know require you to do a, a some kind of treatment, which is a pretty simple process, but it costs money, you know, to have that treatment. Re reverse osmosis, like you said, is, is one. So, but how could I show up with arsenic when the county had given it a pass and said the water was fine? It's possible that you were getting micro small amounts and then it just accumulates in your body. Um, one of the things about arsenic is... It's GMO Free uh, Nevada County is a is, it's a movement more than an organization. We're trying to just educate people on what GMOs are and how they're grown and what the dangers are associated with them. And our goal is to make Nevada County GMO free, uh, which would be add another thousand acres or a thousand square miles of GMO free um, in the United States or in California. Um, and we would be the seventh county in California to join that uh, to join that group of, of counties if we were to achieve that. And that's that's kind of what we've been focusing on. And right now, uh, we have started going to school board meetings and district county meetings, trying to get uh, build it up from the roots up. You know, try to get parents and teachers and administrators involved on um, on the health of their uh, their students and their children. Uh, that's the way we found out that we we were one of the uh, the Green Party helped get a pl uh, single use plastic bags banned, and that was one of the ways we did it. We went to the elementary schools and we got them involved, and then you fill up the city halls filled with little kids and their stories, and it's hard for them to say no to little children. And and uh, and the health of the rivers and the water, uh, so that that's one of the the ways we're going about it right now. Um, I have been kind of out of the loop. I I'm actually a person dealing with cancer right now. Um, I am knock on wood cancer free for four years. Um, last fall, my dad uh, passed away of Parkinson's, which is also has been linked to uh, glyphosate. So these are all personal things that are all coming debt back down to me. So I, my little pitch is going to be more personal. Um, we had a niece who is a third generation sod, born into a sod farming family. Uh, her intestines were born on the outside of her, her body, uh, which is also one of the side effects of glyphosate. Um, California has named it a par probable carcinogen, uh, yet it is still being sprayed publicly. And so these are all concerns that we all have, and most people don't really understand that aspect of it. And then they don't really understand what GMOs really are, and it sounds like we have a great panel of people here to explain it, so I won't even mess around with it, not because I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> but uh, basically, when you raise GMOs, you're killing the soil. There's microbes, there's living organisms in that soil. And when you use herbicides and pesticides, you're killing the life in the soil. So it becomes dirt. There is a difference between dirt and soil. Um, and 
the way GMOs are grown, you are feeding the plant, not necessarily the plant feeding off the soil itself. So it, there's a big difference between healthy looking food and healthy food. And, um, and that's what, kind of the trick that we, gets played on us all the time. I uh, manage a private farm slash ranch. Either I'm a very micro farmer or a very large gardener depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, we grow food anywhere from three to 5,000 pounds of vegetables a year. Uh, we raise livestock, we have an orchard, and we are all chemical free. And um, I am at actually uh, certified in permaculture from uh, a guest coming up soon from Cathay Fish. Um, and we practice regenerative agriculture on the, the property I work on and also on a 900 acre property that's trying to restore the water table or recharge the springs uh, through mob grazing practices. And um, so we're really kind of involved in all that aspect of regenerative agriculture, which really is the future of agriculture. We have to move that direction if we are going to survive as a species. Um, and there is a bunch of numbers on here that I'm not going to bother because it sounds like we have more professional <laughs> uh, people who, um, who will know these numbers. Uh, what I will talk more about is, because I am unofficially representing the Green Party today, is we're in really close relations with our Butte County Green Party. And with that Green Party, we can actually start building on this little coalition with the Sierra Streams, with these other groups um, to get glyphosate banned from our counties. And that would be, and it just goes right along with the uh, NID ditch water, uh, because our, our farm actually gets the NID ditch water as well. Um, and that's always been one of my concerns, is because uh, they give you dates when they're going to spray in the ditches. So we shut off our water at, at the source, uh, so we don't let any of that water come down for three days. Um, so the other aspect of it is reaching out and joining other groups, building coalitions. And um, that is going to be the number one way we get to it. Because it doesn't take many people to get into a city hall meeting or to a school board meeting to make a change. Because so few people, it is somewhat boring, but so few people go to those meetings, a small amount of people could actually get real change done. And, and that's the key um, to getting the change done. And this is an international issue as well. Uh, my brother lives in Cambodia and he has an organization about organic farming and empowering villages to build their own co-ops, to grow their own organic food, to keep the excess to sell themselves so they actually have income instead of giving it to the middle person who they would have to purchase seeds from. They all save their own seeds, uh, they all clean their own seeds, and they trade seeds. And that's another aspect of GMOs um, that people don't quite realize, the concentration of um, seeds and our, the growth of our food. Uh, when we patent life, we're really limiting our ability to actually have diversity and people to survive on it. Uh, in India, um, you know, farmers are committing suicide because they, they're sold a bill of goods on GMOs and what yields they're going to promote. And um, so today, it sounds like it's based on water and health. And um, I just really want to emphasize that uh, GMOs equal glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate, it's not sprayed on individual weeds. It's sprayed on everything. And, and, you know, those seeds are modified so they do not die off. If you were to have a non-GMO seed there, it would die. And so these are, are the concerns that we have and uh, that we're trying to uh, basically ban in Nevada County. And if there were any questions, I was going to see if Cathay would actually come up because she's going to be way more on top of everything because I'm my focus has been on taking care of my dad and my own health. So off the top of my head, I, I don't trust my answers. <laughs> I'd like to have a little more professional opinion. And professional. Yes. Yeah, so this is <laughs> Cathay Fish. So the um, the GMO free group here in our county has been going probably for eight years and it's gone through lots of different uh, rebirths um, it's a it's a pretty small group but it's a it's a pretty feisty group and the goal is there's a lot of goals but obviously the big goal is to make Nevada County GMO free 
I personally would love to see, I'm going to say it out in public, I would love to see Briar Patch go GMO free, at least in the deli. I would like to go into the deli and eat food that is, does not have GMOs on it. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the things I'm working on. And, you know, if you go, if, if you shop at the Briar Patch, how about putting a little uh, constructive comment in saying that you would like to see food, especially meat in the deli, that's GMO free. And you guys know that natural does not mean GMO free. Okay. So you, so take a look. They have great signs, right? Sitting above the f food in the deli. And you'll see the first thing, if it's meat, we'll say a little asterisk for, or a little, it'll say natural. And then everything else has a star because it's um, organic. And so I did a little thing there, my personal little action. I've done a lot of actions there, but <laughs> my own action is when I first moved here, I wouldn't be a member until um, they marked some of their food GMO free. It took me a while, but they did it. Um, so my action right now is to convince them that even if it's spare meat, at least have the meat be GMO free so we don't have to eat Roundup and all that. Natural isn't good enough. Is it for you? No. No, natural is not good enough. So there's all different kinds of um, actions going on with um, GMO free Nevada County. And the uh, meetings are about once a month. And then do you want to, are you going to talk about what you guys did at that biotech place? Oh, that's true. Um, I, I think you should talk that about yet. that because oh, there's some really good activism okay. going on. Okay. Yeah, um, you should talk about and that. And thank you, Kathy. Um, so yeah, my wife uh, was part of the Monsanto 8. Um, last year they were part of the Monsanto 10. Uh, what it is, is it's a um, civil disobedience. Um, it, it's a majority of Green Party, but it's not necessarily Green Party. Um, but they go down to Woodland, uh, to the main uh, place where Monsanto does its... Oh, the largest uh, Monsanto uh, bio lab in the world, and it's called Mo Shutdown Monsanto. So they, what they did was they laid down in the driveway to not allow the, the employees to go through, uh, and, and what the purpose of it is is to be arrested, to then have to go to court and force Monsanto to admit that they their science knows that this is not healthy. Uh, last year, Monsanto did not show up as is expected, but it also allowed the media to come in and do some reporting. So there was a lot of media attention around it, and that's where civil disobedience is a really good tool to try to promote change. Is um, It's nonviolent, and you get your message out, and a lot of information that is usually not heard actually gets reported in the newspaper and on the news that way. So if you're willing to be arrested and, you know, speak out, uh, you know, Contact the Nevada County Green Party. Contact uh, GM free, GMO Free uh, Nevada County, and we will definitely get you on track to participating. Thank you for inviting us here today. I'm Mike Pazner. This is my daughter, Yara Pazner. Uh, we are Indian Springs Organic Farm. We've been farming here in Penn Valley organically for 32 years. We will be co-presenting this afternoon. I'll start with some history of our, uh, some history of the use of Nevada Irrigation's district water on our farm. Yara will give an overview of NID's origins and evolution of current practices, and we'll finish with potential threats and how you can help bring about positive change for health and safety. Once the farm closed escrow in 1986, I went into NID's main office here in Grass Valley to pay my NID bill. They presented me with a calendar of the days they would be shutting my water off during the irrigation season. The reason for the shutoff was a drip application of aquatic herbicides directly into the irrigation water. 
This seemed like the most nonsensical thing to do, putting poison directly into water. Don't the animals drink it? Doesn't it end up in the well water and the natural water system? Over the last 32 years, I've been filing public records requests, attending public meetings, corresponding with NID staff and board members, and making noise. This is not right. Today we're here to convince NID to lead our state and nation in reducing our dependency on aquatic and terrestrial herbicides. NID's water conveyance system was originally developed for miners, resulting in a complicated net of canals and reservoirs that were dug for the temporary purpose of conveying water to and from mines. Over, the last, over 100 years ago, these ditches were adapted to support the new thriving economy growing in our district, agriculture. Today, there are about 475 miles of irrigation ditches in NID, and for the last 40 years, 350 miles of these canals have been treated with herbicides. Roundup is applied to the irrigation ditches throughout the year with no notice beforehand. Roundup contains glyphosate, which, as we've discussed, has been found to be carcinogenic in court for causing Dwayne Johnson's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The, Envi the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has since placed glyphosate on California's Proposition 65 list of chemicals known to cause cancer. NID has responded by forming the Integrated Vegetation Management Working Group with the mission of field testing alternatives to glyphosate-based Roundup. Although the effort is headed in the right direction, this working group is seriously flawed. It is not open to the public, nor is it accepting recommendations from the public to guide their research, which hamstrings the, works, the working group's ability to operate with transparency and potentially to succeed at their mission. Rubber tracked excavators are already used once a year to clean the ditch system, and we propose this method would be suit a suitable alternative to Roundup and the use of elemental copper. The working group is not currently considering expanding on this simple solution. Additionally, the working group is aimed only at reducing glyphosate use. NID has not invested in a program to reduce their dependency on copper-based herbicides such as Nautique, Coutrine, and Keptan, which are dripped directly into the water monthly during the irrigation season, the six months between April 15th and October 15th. During aquatic herbicide treatments, NID is permitted to legally apply copper-based herbicides directly into the water. NID has claimed the copper levels of up to 2,500 parts per million are safe for animals to drink. However, 2008 California Environmental Protection Agency report specifies that consuming 250 parts per million of copper made pigs lose significant body weight and levels as low as 10 parts per million of copper in their diet made sheep ill. Recently, research from NID's California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab. UC Davis's. UC Davis's, yes, I missed it, I guess. UC Davis's health lab indicates that water guidelines for copper levels in livestock, drinking water should not be above 0.5 parts per million, which is 5,000 times less the NID's guidelines, 5,000 times less. A test from our irrigation water on poison day showed 1,100 parts per million of copper in the water. When I presented these numbers to NID, NID's Resource and Maintenance Committee, I earned a cease and desist letter from NID's legal counsel accusing me of stealing water and putting ourselves at risk. Really stealing water? at risk because of herbicide treatments they say are safe to swim in and for our animals to drink. We do, we do have the right to test our water on our own property. Moving forward, we are going to continue asking questions and engaging with NID to help make their public records more accessible. Our two latest public records requests are for exact levels of how copper that are exact levels of copper that are found in irrigation water, natural streams, and above water treatment plants. How much Roundup, and also how much Roundup has been applied to the system during each of their roughly 400 terrestrial applications throughout 2018. 
We also have an interest in motivating NID to update their public information regarding when and where both copper-based aquatic herbicides and Roundup are being applied. So how can you help end this toxic treadmill? Call or write NID. Ask them to open the Integration Vegetation Management Working Group to the public, to us, and expand the group's mission to reducing their dependency on copper and glyphosate-based herbicides. Also, let your board representative know that you are concerned about their herbicide use and its effects on water, livestock, and people. We have developed a website that has this information that we presented here, maps, pictures, and more. Please visit with us after this presentation or online at safeditches.com to learn more. Today, NID's expansive irrigation system has provided irrigation water to farmers and ranchers for more than a century. And that service is integral to our community's rich agricultural history. NID has the potential to be an excellent steward of our community's resource, leading our state and nation away from chemical dependency. Help them realize this potential, get herbicides out of our water. Big thanks to Michael DiMartino for hosting this community resilience event. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for this really it's very interesting forum and I really like this idea the source uh, the area that some place where we could would, anybody could go and get some some great information I think it's a really good idea and um, uh, the Wolf Creek Community Alliance we've been uh, working uh, on do we do water quality monitoring um, in Wolf Creek which is Wolf Creek is a uh, tributary to the bear it's entirely within Nevada County it starts on Banner Mountain goes right through downtown Grass Valley and runs down to the Bear River about uh, about 25 miles long um, we started about 15 years ago um, we do water quality monitoring and it's great to see Mike and Yara here they were Yara was a monitor when she was about this tall and uh, so she's still going in fact she's she's going it's great to see her uh, making, doing what she's doing now. So thank you, Yara and Mike. Uh, she's got some great parents. Um, we do um, the same kind of monitoring that Sierra Streams does. Uh, Kyle spoke a little bit about it before. Um, uh, Circle also does monitoring in the Yuba watershed. We do the Wolf Creek watershed. We have about 25 sites now that we monitor every month. We've got uh, volunteers that go out. Um, and uh, collect uh, mostly just the basic data of the water, which is like the temperature, the pH, conductivity, uh, the dissolved oxygen, and the turbidity. Those things just give you a snapshot of what the water quality is like in general, and it's over time, and then over the, you know, through the year, and then over time also. So uh, that data has been collected now for about 15 years. Um, we're actually just now, we've, you know, collected the data, but um, it's going to be um, put into a more accessible database, and probably within the next six months or so, it'll be much more easy to look this data up, and s you could, you know, pick one of our sites, for instance, and get a history of every uh, data point that was collected over the last number of years. It's, right now it's available, but it's harder to read. So getting it into this uh, new database is going to be a big, big improvement for us. Um, and uh, let's see, the other, the, someone mentioned about how important it is to get kids involved. Um, and uh, we've been lucky, we've been working with the Grass Valley Charter School. Um, they have a great program and they've adopted two new monitoring sites. 
So once a month, uh, this, their, they, they call them, uh, their, their class, their sixth, fifth grade class comes out. They walk from the school, which is in downtown Grass Valley. It's about a half mile walk to their monitoring sites. And they're monitoring two sites it's at, at a confluence where Wolf Creek and Little Wolf Creek come together. And they collect the data and uh, it make kind of a day of it because it's kind of a long walk. They, but it's, it's really great to have them involved. They have also, that same school, they've also petitioned the city of Grass Valley and the Nevada County Transportation Department because they wanted to put up some signs near the little bus station in downtown Grass Valley describing the history of Wolf Creek and the animals and plants that live there. They got permission from the city council. They got permission from the from the Transportation Commission, and you can go down there to the Tinloy bus station right now, and you can see these signs that the kids developed and wrote, you know, created themselves, and got permission to put them up, and and there they are. So it's like really, really cool. We like that a lot. Um, uh, the other things we've just been we try to keep track of uh, uh, things that are of importance to the watershed. Um, we are a very small group. We have one very part-time employee who, monitor, who coordinates our monitoring program. Other than that, we're all volunteers. And um, we have been, we were able to help when, when the city was redesigning their, their, mat, their uh, d um, planning documents for the city, they didn't have any setback requirements for buildings that were gonna be built near, near a creek. And we got the city to include some setback requirements um, and it's not enough, but at least it's something, and it's in it's in the it's in the it's in the city's uh, uh, legal documents now. So that's another thing that we've gotten been involved with. So anyway, Michael, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> <All right. laughs>
that you could easily see in all your pg e bill when you can come into my house and take anything you wanted, when I'd be vulnerable, right? When I wouldn't be home. And I thought, I don't want that. I don't want that graph out there in the public for you to see when I'm coming and going, waking up, and when I'm going to sleep. It's nobody's business. So I want my smart meter removed from my house. It was removed. And as soon as it was removed, that echoing in my ears and that lack of sleep at nighttime immediately disappeared and has never returned since. That is when I realized that EMF sensitivity, electromagnetic frequency sensitivity, is a real thing. But it went much, much further than that. So I began to fight against the Verizon cell tower, and along the way, I began to educate myself. And I learned that this 5G, which is fifth generation, we had 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, now we're 5th G. 5th G is a whole range of different frequencies, right? These frequencies originated with the military. This is a military application. This is the type of frequency that they use for crowd control. This is what they use to actually cause cancers, create heart attacks, right? To even a terrorize a, a particular individual, depending upon the frequency. You can heal with frequencies and you can kill the frequencies. So when 5G came along, what happened was, and this was the doozy that caught my attention, is in the 1996 Telecommunication Act, 1996, how many of us knew about cell phones, right? And, and modems and, and the internet and, and the whole potential of wireless industry. It was, it was just in this infancy stage. But interestingly enough, in 1996, they basically said, look it, you as a deciding body, city council, supervisor, congressman, senator, you cannot make any decisions based upon health consequences. Period. That's a gag order. That would be equivalent to the auto industry coming to, to you and saying, okay, we've invented this car. But we cannot talk about the fact that speed kills. You cannot talk about harm reduction. You cannot talk about the need to add speed limits on the highways or seatbelts or turn signals or brakes or, or airbags. You cannot discuss harm reduction and the harm that speeding down the highway can get you killed. You can't talk about it. If you do, you'll get sued. Since when is this American? That was my red flag that something was seriously wrong. So I began to fight against implementation of 5G. We had a bill last year in California called SB 649. To me, it was nothing more than just floating the idea out there to find out what the cracks were, right? What the loopholes were in what the FCC was planning. FCC chairman Tom Wheeler two years ago basically announced that by 2020, we're going to have over 2 million small cells, which is 5G microwave radiating antennas up and down your neighborhoods, and you have no ability to say no. These bills have now been passed, right? This legislation has been passed. FCC has forwarded this, this bill. And right now, there looks like there may be a stay in the 10th appellate court, so we might be able to hold it off a little bit. In Nevada City, I've been working tirelessly to create what's called a telecom ordinance, right, to actually try to protect our residents and our businesses as much as possible. But it is not easy because basically anything that we had, any kind of standing we had last year has been eviscerated by the FCC in this last year. Right? They know what they're doing. The FCC is a hijacked industry. The FCC is also like the, de the World Health Organization and, 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 and the wireless industry, the telecom industry is actually, interestingly enough, the biggest lobbyist, more than petroleum, more than the, 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 the cigarette industry. They're the ones out there paying off our representatives more than any other industry. So that is what we are up against. So basically, the millimeter wave, just to let you know, right out of the gate, it penetrates your whole entire body. One of the things it does, and this is the most disturbing, is this is actually what people ask, what is 5G? I, 5G is a whole new world where they're going to actually create our physical reality and the virtual reality, and they're going to combine them into the Internet of Things, where basically everything you do, everywhere you go, you will be triangulated, and this hive mind will know. 5G actually, believe it or not, and this is through peer-reviewed studies, and there's thousands of peer-reviewed studies out there, by the way. Don't let anybody repeat the industry live. There's no studies. There's no confirmation. There's no, that is an industry lie. What 5G is, it literally takes your body, and it takes your sweat ducts, and it turns those sweat ducts, and the moisture it's pushing your skin into an antenna that will send out and receive information. Currently, with the smart meters, you can literally opt out in your home. You cannot opt out right now. Elon Musk of Tesla is sending off 5G satellites every three days. They plan on bathing the whole entire planet with 5G, and you cannot opt out. We will literally, within a couple of years, be in a wireless cage.
I've spent the last 15 of my, years of my life building local economy in Nevada City, creating the Nevada City Organic Farmers Market, getting onto solar, trying to support a local economy, our local farmers, our local industries. And I realize that everything that I've done is for nothing if 5G is put into place because it's going to eviscerate all the good that is on this planet. There's something called the Schumann's Residence. Schumann's Residence is a natural frequency of the planet. It has its own frequency, which is 7.83 hertz. Your alpha state is about 7.83 hertz as well. Studies have been done that if you are separated from that 5, 7.83 Schumann Residence, you will actually perish and die. You need that frequency like you need the water and the air. And what's happening is this 5G and all of these wireless technologies are interfering in, that, in us receiving that resonance, right? Which means our health overall is, is going to fail. Interestingly enough, we have doctors and scientists out there who have also noted a correlation between gly glyphosates and wireless cell towers, upticks in cancer clusters. They've also noticed upticks in cancer clusters when you have high metals in your body and your water and your soils and you're consuming them and you have wireless, you'll have a, a higher case of, of cancers. In Nevada County, we have the highest rates of brain tumors in California. We also have an am amazing increase in reproductive organ uh, cancers, if many of you will note. We have many female residents in our county here, and the cancers are skyrocketing. We're talking 20, 30, 40-year-old women. It's actually very disconcerting. The Nation had an expose. One of their um, reporters in did an incredible job on how Americans are being war-gamed. This came from a Motorola internal memo from quite a few years ago that they're going to war-game Amer war Americans like the cigarette industry war-gamed Americans. And what that means is they're going to make sure that anybody out there criticizing wireless industry or the telecom industry is going to be discredited and shut down, whether they're a scientist or an activist. The other thing that they're going to do with war-gaming is they're going to make sure that they put out constant misinformation so as long as you don't know really what the truth is, they can keep getting away with it. And the last thing to be war gamed is when they will place in, uh, people onto the World Health Organization, the FCC, right, the American Cancer Society. So you have industry insiders on these agencies, right, these ABC agencies that are supposed to protect you. And instead, you've got the industry insiders on there protecting the industry. And that's what we're up against. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we have to understand something that we are bioelectric beings, right? We are frequency. We are frequency. It is impossible for this not to impact us. This impacts the birds, the bees, actually the healthy healthy germs and, and the, and the um, uh, 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 creatures in the soil. This affects the soil down to several inches, as a matter of fact, all right? This actually affects the water. This affects the trees. This affects the uh, migratory bir birds. They can't actually migrate. They can't find their ways, nor can the bees. This has an impact on everything from food production, right? And this is the biggest of all. Those who are most vulnerable are the unborn and the young, and this is why. <clears throat> when you are a child, when you're an infant, your cells are, are, are dividing and multiplying, right? So what that means is that as an adult, what took me 20 to 30 years to ultimately um, develop a cancer will take uh, a, teenager, a teenager five to 10 years. And when you give a cell phone or a tablet to a little five-year-old, it will take them two to three years to develop a cancer that would have taken me 20 or 30 years because those cells are multiplying so much faster. And the bones of their body, right, the tissues of their body are much more uh, able to absorb those frequencies than us as adults. So they're far more, far more vulnerable. So what we're seeing now, what was reserved for 65 years and older, what we are seeing now is a deadly brain tumor called the glioblastomas. Those are reserved for 65 years and older. The fastest growing segment of the population in America to get these glioblastomas are 20 to 29 year olds. Why? Because they've had cell phones to their heads now for 10 years. Now we have young teenagers starting at 12, 11, 12 years old, putting a cell phone in their pocket. The fastest growing rate of prostate cancer is between 15 and 19 year old boys because they've had their cell phone in their pocket for five years. We're going to see the same thing with younger, we're seeing, we're seeing children being born with leukemia, unheard of before because their mother's been having tablets and, and, and cell phones and, and laptops, which are no longer called laptops. They're called personal computers because the industry caught on. If they say laptops, they're going to be vulnerable for, for radio frequency injury lawsuits, so they call them personal computers. But mothers with babies have putting their laptops and they're radiating their children. These microwaves are the exact same thing as a microwave in your oven. 
same thing. So when you carry a phone around, you're actually carrying a microwave oven around with the door open 24 seven. Think about that. So the best thing you can do is reduce your risk. And that's what this is all about. We're talking about risk reduction. I have a cell phone, but I only turn it on certain times to check my messages, to, to check my, my um, answer, my recordings, any messages I have. I make sure to not put it in my pocket, to not put it on my beam, to not have it on me at any time. And this is very important, is to keep all of these wireless devices, and you just start one at a time, right? Is you try to reduce the wireless devices and those frequencies in your home at nighttime. Because at nighttime is when your melatonin is released. And that is when you get a good deep sleep, you can restore, and, and that melatonin is actually going out there and it's destroying those free radicals that your body has been making throughout the day. But if you have a wireless device like your um, Alexa or your cell phone or your little Apple watch next to you, you're not producing the melatonin. And you're doing that to the children, I can't tell you what you're doing. So start simple, turn your modem off at nighttime. And then once you get to that point, then you actually can turn the modem off good for good, plug in a good old fashioned ethernet, a little blue cord you used to have to your computer, plug it into your laptop, right? Make sure you remove all wireless devices around you. Get rid of your smart meter. And one of the biggest things is your good old fashioned cordless phone is one of the worst of all. Get rid of the cordless phone and go back to a good old fashioned plugged in phone. And um, lastly, I would say um, is just educate yourself, go out there. There's thousands of peer reviewed studies, hundreds of different websites. And if anybody tells you that microwave frequencies and 5G is safe, you have to understand that you're literally being lied to. And this is, and, and this is the, the, the industry's way of war gaming you. It's serious. Any questions? Yeah. Billy. Airplane mode is okay, but even then airplane mode, even when your phone is off, it can turn on automatically and then start doing updates, by the way, so it's not 100%. Um, there are actually devices out there that you can put into. Um, there's even like Mylar, there's a type of kind of aluminum foil. Um, you use it on your insulation in your homes. You can actually make a little pocket out of that and put your phone into that. But you. And just to let you know, we just, and we're going to put it on YouTube, I'm trying to upload it. We were in a, an area where there's no other wireless devices anywhere near us. We were in a cabin out in the woods, and we actually, we YouTube this. I have my EMF uh, reader, an acoustometer. I said, okay, let's test the microwave. So we turned that microwave on, and it went all the way to the red range, as high as it could go, like you're standing under a, under a big old cell antenna, right? And I backed away from that microwave oven with the door closed 100 feet outside of the house, and it was still in a dangerous reading a microwave oven 100 feet outside of the house. So folks, educate yourself, educate yourself, time is of the essence. Turned on, and then I yelled to the person in the house, turn it off, she turned it off, and it dropped right down again. This is of paramount importance. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Golden Road. Thank you, The Source. I hobbled all the way over here. Thanks to my daughter, Angie, for dragging me out from Marin County. And I think it's important, injury and all, I wasn't taken out by Monsanto. This was another type of injury. Um, it's important that I show up because I resonate with just about what you all are saying I resonate with that and that's why I'm here to kind of bring this all together. And what I've learned after doing over 45 talks since that book came out a year ago was that it's not how many of us show shows up it's who shows up and don't underestimate the value of what one two or three committed people can do especially when you activate the mama bear it's, it's my secret weapon. Um, usually the goal of my medical practice is to piss off as many women as I possibly can and um, the effects are phenomenal. So there is so many, I came to talk about something today, but hearing everyone speak, I thought I would try to maybe tie it all in. Um, what I'm hearing uh, people speak about, glyphosate in your ditches, I didn't know that was an issue. The copper issue, health-wise very significant. Glyphosate, Roundup, 
GMOs, glyphosate and Roundup, a big issue. And certainly what you just heard about 5G, I've been alarmed my, myself about 5G. There are tremendous parallels between what happened with GMOs and 5G, especially in terms of industry uh, lies, just outright collusion, lies, and orchestrated attempts by not attempts, successful maneuvers by industry, how to bamboozle us. It's just quite incredible. So I thought I would talk about children. I've been a pediatrician for almost four decades, and I'll try if I can just touch upon the different points that you all heard today regarding our kids' health, because our children are not faring that well. I'll throw out a few st st statistics because I'm an MD. I love stats, and people seem to believe me more when I talk about statistics, especially you science folks out there who don't want to hear me talk about uh, homeopathy, for example, one of my other passions. Um, so I won't talk about homeopathy. I'll talk about stats. So we now have an issue where one out of two kids has a chronic disease, so that you know. So when you go into a classroom now, half the kids are going to need IEPs and have, you have special ed. And um, I can tell you, most of, my own, uh, most of my friends have kids who have issues, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not um, without an environmental link. Let's be clear. Two, right, 51% of American children now has a chronic disease. And for those of you who don't know, what a chronic disease means is a disorder that's been around for more than three months and is not curable, but curable by allopathic or Western medicine. For, for those of us who are integrative practitioners, my colleague and friend, Dr. Lewis here, we do have other ways to heal chronic diseases, but I'll, I'm just gonna stick to what's reported in what we call Western uh, medicine or allopathic medicine. And those diseases span the spectrum. It's across all boards of health issues from obesity, one out of three kids, asthma, one out of six, and one out of every eight, autistic spectrum disorder, one out of 34 boys, one out of 58 kids, which has gone up since I even wrote the book that came out a year ago, neurocognitive disorders, sleep, out, sleep issues, two out of three kids can't sleep, they have dysomnias under the age of 10, and those are my favorite disorders because people are very motivated to make changes when their kids don't sleep. I just pray everyone's kids can't sleep. Having a kid up all night, oh, you'll change something. So these are the kind of things we're seeing, and I, don't want to leave that mental health issue because in Western medicine, we cut off the head from the rest of the body as if that's a separate disorder. Mental health issues like depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, et cetera, are also sky high. About half of teens report those health issues, 46%. So you see, I think, did I lay the case that we have an issue among our children? And this is not just our children, it's our dogs. One out of 1.6 dogs will now develop cancer. The most common cancer is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My own last dog died of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the reason why you and I know why that is, because that is the leading tumor associated with Roundup, and Mr. Dwayne Johnson, our hero, unfortunately, has a form of non, a very aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and since Mr. Johnson's case came up, there's been about 9,000 lawsuits filed against Monsanto, now Bayer. So this is changing. So anyway, I can go on and on, but I, I don't want to talk so much about, you know, I, you, I, I think you all get the picture that our kids uh, have some issues, right? Our dogs, the wildlife, the bees, it's, we're in the web. I don't need to preach that to this crowd. I think we all get it here. So we got a health issue. So how did I get into this? I got into this as an unwilling activist. I am not an activist by nature. I'm just a feisty New Yorker. I'm just a sassy pediatrician. But I was roped in by one of my moms, a parent from my old practice, and these gals in a kitchen in Marin County were stopping the spray against the light brown apple moth that was going to take place along the entire coast of Northern California around 2006. And one county got sprayed, Monterey, and these gals stopped the spray. And I say these gals, and it wasn't me. I just kind of sat around and drank organic coffee. They were amazing cooks. I ate really well. And so, but during that time, they said they stopped the spray, and I just kind of went along for the ride. And they said, Michelle, what do you think about GMOs? 
And I didn't really have a thought about GMOs. I'm embarrassed to think about that now. GMOs have been around since 1996. I didn't know a damn thing about them. And I said, I'm not thinking much. And one of the moms, Lisa, pointed me to Jeffrey Smith's book. And I read Seeds of Deception. And that's what opened my eyes into the journey of relating to this plethora of chronic disease in our children and understanding the link between chronic disease in kids and the effects of GMOs and their associated pesticides, which are glyphosate-based herbicides. You don't eat a GMO alone without its associated herbicide and effect on our kids' health. So I wanna go into a little bit about what these things do and the effect on our health and why that, how that ties into this water issue because I really wanna keep it germane to what Michael, what the topic of this show is, is the contamination of the water and what's happening here, not just here. And oh my gosh, there's so many counties now in California. So glyphosate, which is this ubiquitous, very simple glycine containing molecule. When you look at the chemical structure, it's like you've gotta be kidding. This little thing does all this damage? Yes, indeed. It's very physiologic looking. It contains glycine and phosphonylmethylglycine. I know more about this molecule than I know about like things that I really should be studying, but I know a lot about glyphosate. And what this, this incredible molecule does is, well, number one, it's an antibiotic. And Monsanto Bayer, um, patented as an antibiotic in 2010 as an antiprotozoal uh, uh, patent. And when I read the patent, because I have a tight sphincter and I went back and looked at that patent, I said, what the hell does this stuff do? What it does is not only kill off protozoa, but Monsanto touted it as an antibiotic against strep, staph, every pathogen, even malaria. Every pathogen you can probably possibly think of was, um, was going to be uh, helped by glyphosate as an antibiotic. So you would think based on that, that we would have studied the effect of glyphosate on the human microbiome. That is the collection of organisms that make up your gut. Your gut is made up of bacteria, viruses, and yeast, and they work in a community called the micro biome, the, the, the mycobiome, and the virome. And it's a very complex interaction because, in fact, we are mostly microbial in origin. Anywhere from 1 to 1 to 10 to 1. It just depends on the individual. You want a big, robust community of microbes in your gut because they are the basis for your health. Do not underestimate the value of microbiome. Love your gut bacteria. So this glyphosate no studies, no human studies in the effect of microbiome, but one may be coming out. Our friend here in the audience may know a little bit about that, but that, may, that literature is going to be emerging very shortly. It's being studied, and it's going to be published pretty soon. So, And it, the, the, the results are showing that, yes, indeed, glyphosate affects the human bi microbiome, um, and Roundup is, makes it even worse. Understand that glyphosate, glyphosate is bad, Roundup is worse. So we all, we all clear on that. No, good question. I didn't even plant you in the audience. So glyphosate and, uh, no, they're not the same. So round, glyphosate is the main ingredient in um, uh, over 700 formulations, Roundup being the most popular. What every company does, whether it's Bear Monsanto, Syngenta, Dow, they and add inerts. Now, notice I put those little, my little fingers waving in the air. Those inert are not so inert. For example, a Roundup has something called POEA, and what that is is a surfactant, and surfactants break down fat. And where you have fat is in your nerve cells, for example, in cell membranes, your mitochondria, the cells. So what those surfactants do is break down the cell membra membrane so the glyphosate can enter the cell and make it yet more toxic. So Roundup has been shown to be way more toxic than glyphosate alone. Most of that work came out of France by Dr. Gilles Eric Serralini, and boy, he was raked over the coals, but emerged triumphant. He's one of the biggest proponents that Roundup is way more toxic than glyphosate. But be clear, glyphosate in itself is not benign. So number one, it's an antibiotic. Number two, it's a metal chelator. That means chelation means it binds minerals like copper, zinc, magnesium, chromium, and all those cobalt, all those essential minerals that you have in your body. And the way that this was discovered is when glyphosate was first brought into the market in the 70s, it was invented in 1950, by the way, by a Japanese researcher. It's been around forever. 
is that they use it as a metal cleaner. The, the staff for company use it as a metal cleaner. And they saw the weeds were dying around where they were cleaning these heavy metals. So they realized that not only is this a heavy metal cleaner, but it's an herbicide. And that's how they started. So it binds. We don't have any human studies on how it binds in humans. We have in cows. We have no human studies of the effect of GMOs and pesticides in humans. We have two studies on Bt toxin in humans, two. And Bt is a form of genetic, mo mod genetic modification using um, uh, bacteria. And so that's what we're eating, just aside. So it's a metal chelator. What am I seeing clinically in kids? Is this relevant? Well, it's relevant to your copper issue. I hear folks out here talking about copper. Yes, it is relevant. So when I see children, they're mineral deficient. They look clinically mineral deficient. They have these little white lines on their nails, these little horizontal lines. They have ridging on the sides of their tongues. They have coarse, dry hair. Clinically, you can look at kids and see that they're sick. You don't have to even have a laboratory. It's called physical exam. Oh, wow, that's crazy. You actually examine a child, and you see that they don't look well. So what we do is when you check them and you do some lab work because men want to see data, so I show the dads the numbers, the numbers are low. These kids, you cannot operate your brain without magnesium and zinc. And kids are low. When you restore their nutrients, they get better. Amazing. Clinical, clinical medicine. It's amazing. That's using minerals. Okay? Our children are deficient. The dogs are deficient. The soil is deficient. We're all related. So this is the other thing that's going on. Copper, just so you know, because I hear so much talk about copper, I, I didn't plan to come talk about heavy metals and talk, because we do need some copper to run our bodies. But copper is in a very nice relationship with zinc. So when you have too much copper, it drives down your zinc. And you need zinc to run about 250 reactions in your brain. And so if you have a kid who's zinc deficient, you better look for mental health issues. So when you have kids who can't focus, who have depression, who have anxiety, why don't you check their mineral levels? And we've known this for over a hundred years. It's called orthomolecular medicine. Dr. Abraham Hoffer in the 30s, 1930s, studied this. And it's a big field of medicine that most pharmaceutical-based medicine will not want you to know because minerals are not patented. They're cheap to treat. One bottle of minerals will cost you about eight bucks, last you about two months, right? You know, we, I won't go down that road. You don't want to take me down that road. No, this is not conspiracy theory. This is just reality. Is there a way people can get their minerals tested? Ooh, indeed they can. I think after I speak, I'm going to let Dr. Lou talk about it because she is a freaking master with the oligo scan. Oh, my God. She did mine. Mm, not pretty. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lou. It's, I'm a work in progress. I'm always working on my own health. But, yes, we work on this together. A couple more things that glyphosate will do, and then I'll move on. It blocks one of the key detoxification pathways in your body called the cytochrome P450 system. So we can't detox. Our kids are toxic. They can't detox. They already have diminished detoxification. And GMOs also reduce their ability to detox by reducing something called glutathione, the master antioxidant in their bodies. Separate research, separate stuff. I don't want to go into the GMO pathway. I want to stick to glyphosate and Roundup because I think that's really relevant right now to your show, what you folks are doing and what we really need to focus on. You heard about the carcinogenic issue. It was labeled by the World Health Organization as a class 2A carcinogen. It would have, which means probable, it would have been an absolute carcinogen except they didn't study it in humans, just uh, animals uh, and rats. And that's why it's a 2A and not a class 1 carcinogen. If they had done the human studies, they would have shown that it was also a carcinogen in humans as well. I just wrote a paper, the effect of pesticides on the microbiome and the link to childhood leukemia. It's going to be out on uh, my website, www.gmoscience.org, and you're not going to find this anywhere else. We referenced over 25 articles in that. We publish twice a month, my little brilliant group and, and myself. Um, bringing out the best uh, literature on pesticides, GMOs, and the effect on health. And we are totally um, <clears throat> underfunded uh, volunteers. We're a lot like your group, Michael. We don't get a lot of money, and we're on a shoestring budget, but we have some of the best people in this field working on this topic. You're not going to find the effects of GMOs and pesticides on health just about anywhere. And this is a travesty. Um, other things that glyphosate does, as if that's not enough, and this is based on the work of Dr. Samsel and Dr. Seneff, and they've taken some heat too, is that, that 
glycine, which is um, one of the major components of collagen, which makes up your musculoskeletal system, swaps out with the, gly with the glyphosate. So you may be having a substitution of glycine in your collagen with glyphosate. And the reason why that's a problem is it can cause musculoskeletal issues. And when you examine children today, they're doughy. Have you felt a kid recently? Go feel a kid. Um, and they are absolutely doughy. Their musculoskeletal system feels, doesn't feel robust. Um, and so this is uh, something I've wondered about. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Where's the data? I'm just going a lot on anecdote, and I'm honest about that. I say when I know something, I say when there's science to back it up, and I say when this is just clinical and an anecdotal. But after doing this now for 12 years, I've been on this road, I have over 5,000 anecdotes. How many anecdotes do you actually want? 20,000, 50,000 anecdotes. I have a lot of anecdotes. So I see something once, I see it twice, I see it three times, and I know I'm onto something. And this is called clinical acumen. It's called clinical experience. So that's what the problem with the glyphosate is. And you heard a little bit about copper um, and the zinc balance that I'm concerned about in your environment. And the last thing I want to touch off is regulators only measure high doses of glyphosate. And we now know that dose does not make the poison. That you have an inverse curve at the bottom of very low levels of glyphosate. Actually, the best study I've saw was on Roundup. So you, it kind of goes like this. There's a curve, right? X, Y. My daughter would be so proud. My, I remember those linear graphs. But look, going right up, more glyphosate, more toxicity. Let's, let's use Roundup, more toxicity. But oh, at the very bottom, there's an inverse U where there's toxicity at very low doses. And those are doses where parts per billion, where your endocrine system work. And Michael Antonio and his group out of King's College in London showed that two parts per billion of Roundup, that is way lower than anything we're eating, caused, not correlated, caused something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in adults, in our rats. Now, we happen to have an epidemic now of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in adults. One out of four people, according to the American Liver Association, has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They're blaming it on the fructose because we're all eating this high fructose corn syrup. But is it the fructose or what the fructose comes from? It comes from corn. Corn is genetically modified and it is sprayed. You do not eat corn that's not organic, that's not been genetically modified. About 96% of, of corn now that's not organic in the US is genetically modified. So if it's not organic, it's genetically modified. So this liver issue is silent and it goes on to develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which then goes on to cirrhosis. Kids have it too, especially obese children, and they already have the NASH, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is the more, more advanced form. It was out of an Italian study. We get a lot of our information out of Europe because Americans are not allowed to uh, research a lot of these issues here because science and universities are owned by big agribusiness. You were talking about Bill Gates before, they own Cornell. Now they're getting into Harvard. Purdue owned, Davis owned. These are owned. They cannot produce research that doesn't align itself with the big agribusiness that's funding them. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. So their research gets shut down. Scientists have been, we are silenced. If you want to watch a good video, we produce the video about this on our website. Feel free to take it and use it. And it links our, what we find to the tobacco industry. Now I could probably go on for about three hours, but I'll just zip it up here and allow for questions. Great. And so we can sort of wrap this up because you know I get wound up, I get very excited, I'm very passionate about this topic. So let's take some questions. Yes. Well, what you're saying is fascinating and I'd like to know more details about your video and how I could actually maybe get involved in the fight with the right groups, possibly. Woohoo! Do you have yeah, a um, yeah yeah yeah? You know, I'd like to know your website and all that. Absolutely, would love to give it out. Good, good, good. Yeah. Right. So um, before I leave, well, before we leave, we'll get you that information. Maybe Michael can put it on this the source. Uh, thank you, thank you. 
And if you go to our website, www.gmoscience.org, we have a section called videos, and we produce this video, and it's a great video. It's a great teaching tool. And um, I'll give you that information again, and you can get it from the source and off our website. So one of the things that really impressed me when I was at the state capitol meeting is with all of you, you actually showed a chart with uh, Bayer, Monsanto, AstraZeneca, and how this closed loop of economic benefit is really self-explanatory. Could you just talk about that mm -hmm. for a minute, uh, where it goes to the livestock and the agriculture and people and the yes. pharmaceutical companies? Well, and I have to give credit where credit's due. That beautiful chart was from my dear friend Howard Vlieger, student of the soil, who's a farmer, an organic farmer for decades, who's been on this battle even, you know, um, before most of us even knew what glyphosate was. And so th the way that Howard does it, and he does this brilliantly, and he walks the walk. Mr. Vlieger walks the war walk. And what he shows is basically from the beginning of the curve, starting with you know um, our food source all the way around that companies like AstraZeneca are making money at both ends the AstraZeneca produces pesticides they also produce the drug for breast cancer right yep. so and basically so what Howard does and he shows you and and if anybody wants that slide you reach out to me and I will get you that slide from Howard he would he will comply and we can put it on your website Oh, oh, go, oh my God, technology, yeah. praise Jesus, hallelujah, I love it. Um, I'm also, uh, I am a Luddite, but I've learned to embrace technology, um, like my 5G colleague there, whose name I can't remember, um, thank you. Uh, so, and that's basically what it's showing, this web of how it's all bought in um, from uh, the beginning to the end, and it's a web, and, and all these links to the web of how this is uh, produced and the big agribusiness are making money at both ends. So, and you know, when we're sick, they make money to keep us sick. Yeah. It's a kind of a dystopian kind of thought. And as a pediatrician, I don't like to think that way. We're supposed to be like the happy doctors, right? But this is how we need to think. Any other questions that I can answer for you? Can yes, please, please. So my name is Joni Blackster, and full disclosure, I'm the national sales manager for a company called Just Thrive. And the study that Michelle was referring to earlier is a study conducted by the research microbiologist behind Just Thrive. His name is Kieran Krishnan. And what uh, it's not what we now have is technology that reproduces in what is called a gut model study, it reproduces the conditions in a human microbiome. Because when you're testing substances like glyphosate and Roundup, you obviously it's not moral and ethical to test it on real people. So they have took three gut model studies, they calibrated them to represent the gut microbiome of a three-year-old, and I asked the microbiologist why, and he said because the conditions are actually very different in a young child's microbiome than an adult. And uh, one of those gut models was the control. The second, number two, they dumped glyphosate, just straight glyphosate into it and measured the effect on the gut microbiome. In the third, they added Roundup, measured the effect on the bacteria population in the gut microbiome. Then what they did was they added the uh, proprietary formula of licensed strains, spore bacteria. These are a new concept to us, the spore bacteria to each one of the uh, gut models and measured the effect. We already know from a human clinical trial that these particular strains uh, created a 42% reduction in the toxins that are produced by pathogens in the gut, and that happened at only one cap a day in 30 days with no changes in diet or lifestyle. So we are expecting uh, to definitely see uh, some significant results from the study. If people are interested in learning more about it, uh, because it's not, uh, it's still in process for being peer-reviewed, analyzed, uh, and it will eventually be published. 
Um, once that happens, those results will be listed on the Just Thrive website, which is thriveprobiotic.com. If people have any other questions about that, uh, I am going to be in a lot of interaction with the microbiologist in the next couple of months, and I'm going to be completely picking his brain about it. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, call me or email me. My phone number is uh, area code 831-246-0162. And my uh, address, email address, is Joni, J-O-A-N-I-E, Blackster, B-L-A-X-T-E-R, dot rep at gmail. So uh, this is probably the most exciting thing that I have ever been able to be personally involved with. So I'm happy to talk about it with anyone. And Michelle is, in a few days, I believe, in less than a week going to be in a conversation, a phone conversation with the microbiologist about the results we have so far. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, I'll wrap up with a couple things that you can do on a positive note because Michael, I really like what you're saying here is Dr. Doom and Gloom, no thanks. Let's be part of the solution because you know this stuff can be pretty depressing. So one, I mean, eat organic, I think everybody gets that. Um, two, you need to uh, give your um, gut a plentiful of bacteria, um, certainly either in the form of probiotics, sporebiotics, fermented food, and or all of that. Fermented food does work, um, and um, even I, I'm no Martha Stewart, even I had my hand at fermenting, and I actually did okay. Um, so yes, ferment, ferment, ferment. Um, that's what I tell people to do. I do people tell people to get a water filter, and I do tell people to take the shoes off at the door, even though my house, I can't get people to do it except me, and then I walk barefoot on all their crap. But um, the reason why that's so important is because the most toxic thing in your house is your house dust. Yes, right. Um, the s biggest source is pollution and house dust. And house dust has been shown to have high levels of tons of toxins and toxicants. And so by just by taking your shoes off, you reduce the toxic load for yourself, children, and your pets. And having had three dogs now with cancer, I'm very sensitive to this issue, but this is indeed true. So those are kind of simple things that you can do at home. I used to tell people, put your money where your mouth is and just shop organic, that was enough, but that is not enough anymore. And so we all have to be part of the regenerative movement, and I think we all have to take a stand and do something, no matter what it is. Thank you. You guys pissed off a little bit? No. <laughs> Are you inspired a lot? There's hope. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carmen, and I just wanted to remind people that um, four out of the Monsanto eight that were arrested on October 15th at uh, Monsanto Woodland for protesting. <laughs> Our arraignment is coming up on the 22nd of this month, so uh, please give us all the support that you can. Thank you. <laughs> all, right. All, right. all right, so we have one last speaker. I know we've gone a few minutes longer. Um, we are going to have some food after this. That's a time where we generally like to break bread and actually kind of let the rubber hit the road, per se. I know some people had to leave, so it's a little frustrating. Uh, for me sometimes to have so many amazing people here and trying to connect the dots but one of the reasons that we spent hundreds of hours uh, with the programming to develop the technology and the network everything you hear all the keynote speakers are all platinumized and they all have access and hopefully we're asking them even if it's just once a week post your events post this information let's create an alternative media source and information source outside of the corporate media who has uh, their own agendas. So. My name is John Pujol. I'm here at University of California, Berkeley. Um, my team is Simple Water Tap Score. 
Our business is to make it easier for people to test what's in their water. We want folks to know what they're drinking at their tap, bathing in, cooking with, uh, all the water quality that goes into a house and all of the things that happen to the water uh, when it's in your house. The pipes obviously have lead, uh, but groundwater itself can contain arsenic and other harmful contaminants and we find it important to identify what those contaminants are, tell folks uh, what they mean for their health, and uh, how to remove them. And we do that by selling kits online, water testing kits that we sell uh, on mytapsquare.com. And uh, how'd you end up getting involved in the department and uh, the business? So I started uh, several years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, studying water sciences here at Berkeley, uh, initially with arsenic remediation, initially with a focus on removing arsenic from groundwater supplies and. Uh, slowly that transformed into a quest to actually analyze the water itself and figure out what is in the water because we found that there's a lot of treatment technologies out there um, but hardly anyone actually testing the water at home. Uh, so our mission became less about building a new treatment solution and more about identifying the problems people really face. So for people who are watching right now, what is the first step if they're concerned about their water? Um, what can they do? How do they get in touch with you? And typically, um, in this area, obviously, of, of Berkeley, what are people finding in the water? Fortunately, we're blessed here in Berkeley to have like, really good water quality. Uh, the most common issues that we encounter pertain to old piping. Obviously, things like lead, uh, other solders, materials that exist uh, in old pipes and in old plumbing and appurtenances. Um, but the actual water quality that we are served by the public water system here, and worth noting that most folks in Berkeley and in Oakland are served by a public water system and in San Francisco. Uh, that water quality is great. Ebb Mud does a good job. Some people don't like the chlorine, the chloramines. There are health risks associated with having too much of these in the water, too much of the chlorination disinfection byproducts that can emerge um, if chlorination isn't working properly. But by and large, we're really happy with the public water system we have. Um, is, there, is there fluoride in the water here? Sometimes. Sometimes. And where, yeah. I think there's a lot of, uh, fluoride is an interesting one. You know, fluoride, you have, you know, new, you know, new science all the time, um, mostly emerging on the side that fluoride is great for your teeth. No one's doubting that. But drinking it in your tap water uh, doesn't really help you as much as I think uh, initially people wanted it or assumed it would. Um, having it in your toothpaste, uh, probably worthwhile, as most of the data suggests, it does prevent cavities. Um, Drinking in your tap water, more ambiguous. Uh, there's very little time for fluoride to actually be in contact with your teeth when you're drinking it. Uh, and so most of that fluoride is just going straight to your digestive system. Uh, and since fluoride is a toxin, um, there's concern that even at those low levels, it could be building up and causing issues. But to be honest, uh, the story's still out on fluoride in drinking water. Right. And if people would like uh, more information uh, about getting in touch with you and having their water tested, how could they do that? Yeah, we're really, we've got a really cool service where uh, we're very proud of giving folks the access to professional scientists, graduate student researchers, plumbers, um, other industry professionals who are standing by at all times on our website, mytapscore.com. Uh, and you can reach out and chat there, ask any questions. It might be a silly question, it might not. It might be a really complicated question that takes us a week to get back to you on. Either way, we're happy to hear the problem, hear the question you have, and do our best to answer it as quickly as we can. Well, like I said, I'm really uh, happy to meet with you today, and I appreciate your time here. I know you're, you're busy, especially with your holiday sale. Um, and I was, of course, re was referred to you by a water scientist who has been involved in water processing and has worked for municipalities for years. So you came highly recommended because of the, the spectrum of things that you test for. Traditionally, people might be testing for things like pH. So uh, I really appreciate meeting you because some of the things we're dealing with in our county uh, is in Nevada County, there's over 425 miles of irrigation ditches from the gold rush days. And uh, a lot of the way that the Nevada Irrigation District, the water utility, deals with some of the issues like um, the algaes. They're using uh, copper-based heavy metals uh, and various products in the water. And then they're also doing really heavy and excessive spraying along the irrigation canals with Roundup and other herbicides that, of course, uh, have their own ramifications on community health. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, really happy and honored to meet you and excited to kind of get some results. We just went out and tested a public spring that every day hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, come to fill up their water. Um, there's a disclaimer from the county that they don't test the water. They're not responsible. 
But nonetheless, um, we're going to start, uh, and we're very happy again to start collaborating with your lab um, to not only help bring you more clients, but to help preserve the health of our community. And most importantly, to get some really tangible science behind some of these uh, locations. Great. I think what you're doing is a really important mission, and it's something that needs to happen nationwide as we've, uh, in my opinion, become a little bit uh, uh, a little bit lazy in terms of trusting uh, the water quality that comes out uh, of our taps. A lot of this is not just public water system issues, it's also just groundwater wells. A lot of folks never test their groundwater and we know that in wells you have lurking contaminants like arsenic that you can't ever taste, you won't smell it, you won't see it, um, and it's a known carcinogen. And it's important that people kind of spread the word, do some level of testing, and if you find an issue, tell people and treat it. Because, I mean, life's worth living, no reason to get sick uh, or hurt or uh, uh, have some kind of a temporary illness even because you have bacteria or heavy metals in your water. And of course, some of the other issues, uh, I'm sure as you know, uh, in this day and age is the level of, um, I believe there's over 4 billion prescriptions a year filled in the United States. And of course, a lot of those end up through people urinating um, or putting them down the drain. A lot of those pharmaceuticals end up in our water. Um, and also not only just the pharmaceuticals, but also microplastics has been a huge issue. Um, I know. So do, you, is your lab involved in any testing around those issues? Is there ways to test for those um, in our water? And even more importantly, would you recommend maybe some solutions for people? Maybe there's a certain type of water filter. What, what can they do to protect themselves? We like to give everyone a personal recommendation because water quality can be so different for so many different people. Uh, and also needs are different. If you're a renter, if you're an owner, if you have a basement, if you have radioactive issues like radon, or if you have heavy metal issues, it all varies kind of our suggestion. Uh, there's no silver bullet is what I'm saying. Well, just testing for pharmaceuticals or microplastics. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of interest in that. Um, we do microplastics testing, we do pharmaceuticals testing, PFAS testing. Um, I think we probably will say yes to any type of test insofar as we can figure out how to have it tested. Um, and that's part of the brilliance of our model, we think, is that we have such a wide network of testing capabilities that just about anything we can deal with. Now, if you choose something kind of wild and, and, and out there, it's going to be more expensive. Um, that's the only problem, but we'll do it. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's kind of what we're striving towards is that we can become a one-stop resource for anyone who wants to test absolutely anything in their environment. Fantastic. And, and I know you just uh, mentioned about radon. I know that that's another huge issue up where we live. So if suppose someone has a uh, cement floor basement and there's a presence of radon, um, is that getting into the tap water? Is it getting into the groundwater? Maybe if they have a, uh, issues as far as drainage and maybe a French drain is, you know, how does the radon affect the health um, besides the inhalation uh, as far as the water in a, in a domestic house or dwelling? It's actually, it's a very, it's a good question and a strange one. Uh, radon continues to be an inhalation issue even in tap water. I mean, sure, you will ingest some of it if it's dissolved in the water, but generally speaking, you're being exposed uh, to radon gas. The radon gas will come out you know, with the water from the tap or from the from the shower faucet. Um, and especially if you're in a hot shower and you're spending 15 minutes in there and that water's coming out just spewing, you know, radon gas, uh, that inhalation can be very, you know, very damaging to your health. Um, in particular, you know, radon gas uh, usually exercises its harm on you um, through the uh, emission of alpha particles, uh, form of radioactive decay, and those are known to degenerate cells, cause cell damage, potentially to cancers. Um, if you were to think about radon gas in water versus radon gas in air, the rule of thumb is that the radon in the water has about 10% of the effect of the radon in the air, um, which is why it's not as regulated. Um, that said, 10% can still be a lot if you've got a big problem. Um, and also for a lot of people, it's like, let's just limit it as low as we can. Um, so it may not be a big, as big of an issue as, as the radon in your basement, but maybe you want to have no issue at all. And there are ways to get rid of radon in your water. They're just not that super cheap, um, unfortunately, not yet. And, and can radon pass through like piping or pass through um, and actually get into the water? Or is it something that comes into the house itself in the water already? It typically comes in with the water. So if your okay. water is in contact with like a radon um, 
a, a contaminated aquifer, then when the when the well is pumping that water um, and that water is coming up through the pipes, it's bringing radon gas with it, dissolved in the water. And as soon as that radon gas has a chance, um, it will evaporate into a gas. Um, and so you'll, you'll, that's why you end up inhaling it, even though it's coming through your tap water. All right, even if you're maybe using even fans in your basement to blow the radon out. It's still coming through the water. Right, the yeah. right. And then lastly, just any suggestions, uh, maybe there's a, uh, maybe not as an endorsement, but again, solutions, maybe this particular type of water filter, ceramic, carbon, charcoal, something that people can use that's gonna help filter out the majority of these things. Sure, I mean, there's, like I said, no silver bullet. Um, and in California, drought written the state, uh, I guess not so much up in Northern California, but certainly in Southern California, uh, the suggestion of using a reverse osmosis is always a little bit politicized. However, that is probably the easiest one answer I can give you for removing almost all of the metals and all the, the various ions that'll be in water. Um, ceramic filters, catal catalytic carbon, these are great, um, but they don't always remove the heavy metals that we're worried about. They'll do a much better job with chlorine. Sometimes they'll do a good job with fluoride, but they have to be specifically labeled as such. And if you have any questions, just message us. We're happy to tell you. We know the products inside now. Oh, fantastic. Again, I really uh, appreciate your time today. And um, as far as the water filtration piece, um, so again, it's, it's really purely on the things that you have in your water uh, as far as what, what works. Just lastly, could you just briefly explain, explain reverse osmosis? Because I know people go and will pay a lot of money at the health food store to get different types of water, purified water, uh, spring water, reverse osmosis. Can you just briefly tell us the difference of those? Sure. Um, there, you know, it, it's worth noting there's a lot of silly crazes out there. Um, Silly in the sense that, you know, they might be true, but there really isn't the kind of validation out there at the moment, um, which, you know, you, you can rally behind full force um, without at least appreciating the fact that, you know, the, uh, the science isn't fully in. Uh, things like spring water, alkaline water, um, these are a bit kind of uh, still unsure of what the benefits are, and a lot of times they can actually be harmful, um, worth noting. Um, as far as reverse osmosis treatment goes, it operates on a process in which you're using a membrane that selectively removes um, uh, charged particles from entering your final water supply. So if your raw water supply is coming in with a bunch of different charged particles that you don't want, uh, those charged particles will not move through the membrane. And therefore, the only, the only material in your water that will move through the membrane is the water, the H2O. Now, there's some gases that will move through, um, there are contaminants that will ruin the membrane, and so it's not always such a simple answer. But you can think of the reverse osmosis membrane as a filter with really, really, really tiny holes um, that operates on a principle of exclusion, excluding things that cannot you know, fit through uh, that membrane. On the other end, you get clean water. But you have a waste stream, and that's why it's considered a little bit wasteful, because you know reverse osmosis might take in, you know, 100 liters of water, spit 40 of them out as waste, and only deliver 60 of them as final product. Um, so if you're if you're in a drought-ridden area, you know, RO is a bit of a, a, a political word. Yeah. And of course, having a filter on your shower for whatever chlorines or sure. things are in the, your water, and of course, having one at your tap mm -hmm. uh, is always helpful, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You got the shower filters are great, especially if you're feeling like dry skin or if you recently moved and you're having weird skin reactions. This is something we have a lot of um, people complaining about a new home and, you know, I go to shower and I get these weird rashes or my hair feels really dry. Those are typically water quality issues and are often related to either a metal in the water, a softener that's connected to the home, or higher chlorine levels than you're previously used to. All right, so uh, most of our uh, customers will, will order a, an advanced city water test, an essential city water test, an advanced well test, or an essential well test. Those all come in these boxes. It's got everything you need, shipping labels, materials, like very clear sampling instructions so you know you're getting like this, uh, a proper sample. And then you have, in addition to kind of those more common tests, um, more esoteric tests, things for PFAS, um, pharmaceuticals, soil testing. You know, we have all sorts of other uh, less common types of tests, um, pharmaceuticals, radon and so forth, which require either dry ice or some other form of preservation that's more advanced, and they'll come in these bigger coolers like this. Um, yeah. 
And you're doing soil testing also? Yeah, we do soil testing as well. Yeah. We, we, some of these tests require folks to exercise you know, caution because the materials that are being used to preserve the samples are dangerous. So we, we try to make that obviously very clear. Um, like I said, for most of the cases that we're dealing with, people who are testing their water in their home, it's a very simple box. There's nothing dangerous about it. Uh, it's all about just following the instructions and sending them in with the prepaid shipping label. And again, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Oh yeah, if you go to mytapscore.com and uh, there's usually a little blue button on the bottom. You click it, you'll be talking to a water scientist in a couple minutes. Well, great. We'll be back in touch and we're really happy to be working. We're definitely going to uh, spread the word about the, the lab here and what you're doing with uh, your, your organization because I think you're providing a, a central resource um, and something that's very new paradigm because it really takes, uh, you know, this type of innovation and organization so people can actually know the science and the, and the reality about things and not just assume or, or fall victim to some fake news or what the current trend is. So again, thank you for, for all your time and work and what you do. Cool, my pleasure. Yeah, we want to democratize science and that's the kind of big picture goal that we keep moving towards. Well, you're doing it here on of course, uh, University of California, Berkeley has uh, been known for you know over 50 years of really being at the cutting edge of of, of social change and, and science and technology. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me on the show. Hello and uh, good day to all of you out there watching this video. I'm Michael DiMartino, the host and producer for Golden Road TV and Radio. And today I'm working in collaboration with ARC, the Alliance for Resilient Communities. And we have the great honor to spend some time, get to know, and to interview David Howland. So welcome. Thank you for having me here today. And uh, we got to meet the other day at the farmer's market briefly. You're doing some really important work. Uh, which has come to light in recently the, the legal case with the gentleman in Vallejo who won against Monsanto, but also with Michael Parson who got front page on the union talking about the effect of Roundup on the organic farms in Nevada County. So um, you're here, you're a, a specialist, you have an illustrious history. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background of what brings you to this work today. Well, in the last uh, seven years, I've been working on a biological sensor that monitors the level of life in water or other fluids. It provides an output in proportion to how much life is in the fluids. And prior to that, I managed uh, an, a, an engineering department, product development in water treatment, uh, especially in chemicals, chemical controls, and, and such. So, so you're not a hobbyist. You really are a specialist. Uh, yes. Fair Fantastic. Enough. Fantastic. Great. So thanks for being here today and let's get right to it. Tell us here in Nevada County and for many around the world what's happening and what's in our water. Well there's a lot of stuff in our water and it's quite a challenge for the water providers to manage it. This is surface water primarily here. Uh, water treatment intends to remove toxins and to control pathogens and they do a pretty good job of that actually. Uh, many toxin Toxins, including pesticides, are, are entering our water, and that's a big concern to the farming community here, as they use the raw water before it goes through the treatment plants. And of course, pharmaceuticals, uh, yes. all sorts of things. You get microplastics are getting into the water. Yes, and the mining industry as well. Right. right. So, so let's elaborate. Uh, again, we could talk for hours on this topic, but what's the the difference when we get water out of our tap between treatment mm -hmm. and filtration? Uh, water, water treatment is much more comprehensive than just water filtering. And water filtering is still absolutely essential that you do that on your taps and your showers and your schools and what have you. Absolutely essential, especially in these day and ages. Yeah. And of course, chlorine and all the other things, maybe rusty pipes, which all affect us outside of the pesticides and the pharmaceuticals and all the other toxins that find their way into our, into our drinking water. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, if you have pipes that are super old, it will leach in uh, lead, for example, and, and, and be beyond the limits. 
Right. Yeah. So can you uh, give us a little bit of insight of what water providers must go through as far as regulations to bring drinking water to consumers? They're responsible to meet maximum contamination levels set on the toxins that they're responsible to remove from the water. Um, and, and is it true that some toxins can't be removed from drinking water? Some toxins are much more difficult to remove from water in certain water processes, and they may or may not include those water processes in water treatment. So, so knowing this information uh, here specifically in Nevada County, mm -hmm. um, what are the concerns of farmers, whether they're getting water from the NID ditch or they're getting it from the tap or th through public utilities? What's yep. the big concern? Primarily it would be the pesticides that are uh, in the water. Water providers are using uh, Roundup in the ditches and they're approved to do so. Farmers are a little concerned with that. There's also sources of Roundup and other pesticides in the raw water before the treatment plants. And so the organic farmers are especially concerned that they're feeding Roundup to their plants and animals. Which is what got Michael Parsons his front page uh, interview in the union because he is an organic farmer and he brought to light that, well, a lot of the farms here in the county might not really be organic because they're using this NID, this Roundup and glyphosate tainted water, along with all of the other toxins that are potentially in the water. So um, <clears throat> knowing that, is, is there a history of toxic chemicals in the United States that are being used that are directly um, affecting consumers in general? Well, yes, that brings us to, uh, to this guy here. In uh, 1917, the, what's called the radium girls were hired to paint the radium on the dials of watches and clocks. And what was interesting is nobody knew at the time that that was a toxin. And it took 21 years or so before uh, they realized that. And some of the deceased bodies of the ones that survived glow in the dark. So that's pretty heavy stuff. So, you know, of course, in this day and age, there's a lot more things that are coming to light. Things like uh, the effects of GMOs, uh, the use of, of bio and geoengineering uh, to potentially slow down climate change. So we can see everywhere fluoride in our water, inorganic food, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, uh, that there are a lot of toxins that are using in our water. So is there something that we can add to our water or do to our water to make it a little safer? Water filtration is the, the point of use water filtration is the, is the thing that we must do more, than, more now than ever before. Right. And it has to be the appropriate kind of water filtration and they have to be serviced properly. That's what we can do. Right. So uh, again, we could go on uh, this subject, I know for a lot of time, but We'd like to get right to the point. We don't want to just bring issues to light here through Golden Road TV and ARC. We want to really give solutions. So what, what can people do besides the water filter? Yeah, water, water filtration is the, big, is the biggest thing they can do. But they can also vote for people that are more interested in health issues. Uh, they can learn and teach. They can inspire others. They can ensure point of use water filtration is in their schools. And they can consciously look for water filtration and, and point of use and, and make a change there. And they can get involved in any way that, that makes sense to them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once again, you're tuning in to Golden Road TV. I'm your host, Michael DiMartino, working in collaboration with ARC, the Alliance for Resilient Communities. I want to thank David Howland uh, for his time and his expertise, and also for some really exciting uh, patents and inventions that you're working on that are dealing with some of these issues. So. Thank you so much for yeah. your time. You're welcome. All right. And we'll be back. Hi, my name is Kevin Danaher, co-founder of Global Exchange and the Green Festivals, and I'm here in Nevada City at the former Nevada City Airport, it's a hundred acre site that the city recently put out a proposal for what to do with it. So I'm working with Michael DiMartino of Golden Road Radio Show 
and the Alliance for Resilient Communities, building a network of resilience organizations here in northeastern California. This site of 100 acres, which is empty, as you can see, is now up for grabs in terms of what is it going to become. So we're trying to bring together a lot of diverse people and organizations to say, look, this could be a platform where we bring together the permaculture people, the artists, the youth groups, the environmental groups, CAL FIRE. We've got some serious issues confronting us in California in terms of how do we manage our forests and how do we more generally manage our land. So one of the things we could do here is the city could give a dollar a year lease to a coalition of groups to develop this property as a showcase for those technologies that are already in existence but that are going to be the dominant technologies of the future. Renewable energy, green building, water conservation and purification, organic agriculture, hemp, the farm bill that's coming through Congress makes hemp legal nationally. So that's a massive potential generator of income and jobs and housing because there are people now who know how to do small houses. There could be a facility here on 100 acres. You've got plenty of room for setting up a manufacturing facility. It could be solar powered, a big solar farm. We know how to do all of that. And the time is right because the economic system is going to crash and the environment is crashing. Every biological system on the face of this earth is in a state of rapid decline, if not collapse. The economy is also going to crash because you can't have an economic model that continues to say grow, grow, grow in a finite planet with finite resources. That just doesn't work. Everything is running out. So we have to switch to a balanced approach to the economy of how are we going to pass on this planet to future generations so they don't curse us for having screwed everything up. And there, so there's two things going on. One is the system that is, is getting worse. The system that could be keeps getting better. Wind energy, solar energy, the prices are coming down, etc. If we get people to understand you don't need to live in the world that is. You can live in this world that is becoming, that unleashes a lot of spiritual and political energy. And we can build a movement starting with this location right here. So ideally, what would be some of the projects that could be happening up here, both for uh, environmental education, community education, uh, uh, economic development, and also to, to provide solutions for some of the problems that are happening? What are some things that could be going on here? One of the things I would suggest as an initial thing is to bring a whole bunch of permaculture people out here. Permaculture is a design science that says, let's figure out how we can live in harmony with nature and do biomimicry. Look at how nature recycles water. See how nature grows trees and sequesters carbon. A tree, we're never going to invent something better than a tree in terms of sequestering carbon, storing water. People don't realize when you're out in the forest, the trees put out pheromones that lower your blood pressure. The, the Japanese do a thing called forest bathing. So we could educate all sorts of people, integrate it with the schools, bring the kids out, have them learn forestry, have them learn firefighting technology. How do you make a forest safe for, for fire by removing low fuel? All sorts of activities like that, both educational but also productive enterprise things like rustic furniture you're going to be cutting down some trees and cutting wood okay let's build stuff out of it let's build t uh, tiny houses there's people in the bay area who know how to do that they can come up and do workshops cob building workshops all sorts of trainings that people will pay to get that training and then you've got something left behind a structure left behind so i would see this property as a platform for building unity. Fingers are breakable when they're like this, when they're like this, when they're united, they're unbreakable. The motto of the United States is E Pluribus Unum, 
from many, one. And that spirit of building unity across political, religious, racial, gender barriers bring people together and create a platform for helping us accelerate into the next economy, the green economy. And, and as opposed to just being a concerned citizen, just tell people who might be watching this a little bit about your background and uh, how you've been involved with Green Festival and also TED Talks and just uh, let people know a little more about yourself and uh, so they can understand that you have a, a world of experience and background and, and you see the potential with this property. Well, my mama told me never, never say things about yourself. Self-praise is no praise, as she used to say. But, yeah, I got a Ph.D. at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you very much, Banana Slugs. Go Slugs. And, uh, yeah, uh, Global Exchange. We started Global Exchange in 1988. It's still in existence 30 years later. Human rights organization educating the American people about what's going on in the world and why U.S. policy in most places sucks. And the Green Festivals, we started in 2002 as a reaction to what happened in 2001 with the towers yeah, crashing and all this kind of stuff. And I said, we got to do something positive. We can't just be against the empire. We got to show people there's a green economy. And the green economy movement has taken off like a rocket. If you look at the data on solar energy, wind energy, green building, all these efficiencies, it's growing faster than the general economy. So that's going to be the future, especially as biological systems break down. People don't realize when all the ice on this planet melts, which it is doing, it raises ocean levels over 200 feet. It's the elbow on the Statue of Liberty. That's going to create massive migration to places like this that are lightly populated. So it's up to us who live here in Northern California to figure out ways that we can educate people about how do we transition to a totally renewable, totally sustainable, circular economy that doesn't extract from nature, but helps nature be even more productive than it is. Great, thank you. And lastly, any uh, words of wisdom you'd like to let leave people with? Because, you know, people who might be watching this might be uh, living in, in, in a house somewhere in middle America. They might have a, a very busy life, children, families, or be taking care of a, a senior parent or something. What can people do practically just in their own house, in their own home to help, um, you know, protect the environment and also to live a healthier lifestyle? Well, one of the things you can do is if you go on YouTube and you put in my name, Kevin Danaher, K-E-V-I-N-D-A-N-A-H-E-R, You'll see a whole bunch of lectures I've done and interviews I've done and stuff like that. And what it comes down to, I think, is we're in the process of redefining what love means. Not the little love in a Hollywood movie of two people, a little island of happiness in a sea of misery, but big love. Nobody left out. It's what all the great spiritual leaders, Jesus and Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King, all these great spiritual leaders had the same message, love. Love is the answer to all questions. Unconditional love. Reaching out to our brothers and sisters who are less fortunate. Reaching out to Mother Nature and instead of destroying her with this extractive economic model, but being generous of spirit. And it turns out that when you're generous of spirit and you're kind to other living things, it improves your physical health. So we're seeing science and spirituality coming together. The golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated, exists in almost every culture in the world. And now what we're doing is we're unpacking that word others to mean all living things. Treat other living things the way you want to be treated. Great rule to live by. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I know you're uh, undertaking a similar type of a resilience project up in uh, Plumas County at your place. So again, thank you for your time and for coming up here to Nevada County to help uh, raise more awareness about the potential of this spot for us. And we look forward to collaborating in the very near future more. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.